The earlier that you get technical writing's eyes on a feature that's upcoming, the better the content will be, the more collaborative that can be. And uh, we've definitely seen results get better as we've been thought of more earlier in a feature's life cycle. When you get involved by others earlier, you suddenly realize how much stuff is actually constantly happening in the company you used to not see before. And yeah, the volume of input that everybody would love to have in a perfect world, you know, if everybody had all the time in the world, the volume of input that people would welcome is incredible. Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Laura Wash, and I'm going to host today two wonderful people from Kodak Company, Paulina Zaitskina and Max Clayton Crofts. Welcome back to API The Docs. Thank you. Welcome back because you were uh, guests of the API The Docs showcase series uh, last year in 2023 in the autumn, where you were, um, well, mostly Paul and I were doing the demo, uh, but we also talked with Max about the Kodak product portal and the Kodak documentation portal, uh, the recent changes that you had back then and the, the reasonings behind that. Um, Paulina, uh, you are a senior technical writer at Kodak. Can you tell a little bit more about uh, what is the current uh, title and what does that entail in your work? Uh, yeah, you're right. I am a senior technical writer, um, which for Kodak basically means that I'm the main person who's responsible for creating, um, editing and maintaining Kodak's public docs. Um, I also work on documentation strategy and enablement of different contributors. And outside of that, I'm also an organizer for London's technical writer meetups. And that's relatively recent, right? Uh, yeah. So we kicked off the meetups again from March this year. Um, yeah, it's been going pretty great. Um, the the reception by uh, the other technical writers who are based in London has been amazing. They're very excited to uh, get back to seeing other people and sharing experiences. Um, we just had our most recent meetup last week, actually, uh, which was amazing. We talked about editing documentation um, and even did an interactive exercise as part of it, where we were all collaboratively editing a, a piece of writing, which was quite a different, quite a quite a new experience for everybody. Uh, yeah, so you can find us on Write the Docs London if you just Google that. Oh, that's really good. I was really happy to see that uh, that uh, the the meetups that are also restarting. We're also restarting the one in Amsterdam, oh, yeah. um, so we're finally meeting again. And uh, Max, you are a product director for experience at uh, Kodak, which is a really really great job title to have too, <laughs> and very interesting. It's a, um, a a super mixed skill set. Then also, can you tell a little bit you? belong in the same team as Polina and what do you what do you do under this this role title yeah it's a bit of a mouthful isn't it um <laughs> my role at Kodak has changed a few times I came in as uh, just product manager and over the past couple of years also took over a number of like the core things all the interaction points of Kodak including like documentation our developer portal authentication flows and more um so it's quite, a, yeah, a diverse job. But um, I, as part of my involvement with the documentation, I engineered our new website when we redeveloped that about a year and a half ago. Uh, I had a previous life as a front-end engineer, so I kind of used that to build our new docs. And uh, I, I manage Polina, um, but we collaborate closely on our technical content work. And so Polina's more of the wordsmith and I'm more of the engineering kind of aspect. Then I'm going to ask the worst mate, what does Kodak do? Just so that everybody knows. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Uh, yeah, uh, we Kodak is a company that solves challenges in providing financial services for small and medium-sized businesses, which means that we provide business data products for small and medium business lending and also for embedded accounting automation. Our products connect banks and fintechs to all the major accounting, banking, e-commerce, and payment platforms that small businesses might use. Um, and this enables them to build features that save small businesses time and get them faster access to capital. And for example, one of the ways that we deliver this is through developer-focused SDKs and APIs. And that's also where our documentation and developer portal experience come in. 
we were going through quite a big strategic change as a company that kind of really drove some of those more architectural, um, the architectural change in direction for the docs. So Kodak previously was one big universal API and really we, we presented that as one product and it was really actually hard for developers to make sense of what you could do with that. And then as we kind of matured in our search for product market fit, we began to sort of disentangle the different core use cases and we rolled those out as distinct products. And at that point, it was really important that we could fragment our documentation accordingly as well. And that was where we really arrived at what we have today, which is kind of a core common section. And then uh, six or seven kind of distinct separate sections where we dig into uh, all the different things that our different products, our distinct products have to offer. And I think Kodak has a particularly difficult challenge in terms of like, if you look at some other websites or some other um, similar great documentation resources, they don't maybe have quite as much to document as Kodak does. So we have uh, maybe like 450 pages of content and that's because we've got six distinct products and then these kind of core aspects and then each of those have so many different specific API endpoints and concepts. So trying to wrangle that into one website was definitely a real challenge. I think I can also add that with the nature of the products or with nature of Kodak as a business, there, there we we couldn't find a straightforward or an obvious way to, you know, explain it in one, two, three, or explain it in five words or explain it in a in a succinct image. Um, so yeah, we kind of ended up looking for any other opportunity to make the docs and therefore the products. Uh, more digestible, I guess. Um, yeah, which is why we ended up with, with what we have, as Max said. So that was a lot of changes happening in Lockstep. Um, Max, you were referring to a prior um, podcast episode here with Rachel Lina Bors, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Rachel was um, quite succinctly and uh, decidedly put the reasons why someone would want to go through such a huge change in choosing a different tax set uh, for, for a deaf portal. And you said that you agreed with that in some ways. What was the most important thing? Because some of these were constraints, but I guess you could find work around them. What was the tipping point? The, yeah, the most important two things for me, and I definitely would recommend people just go back and check out that podcast. But the most important thing was about the user experience. And I think when you use a CMS, you often don't get license to play about with user experience because you're more just throwing content into a template. And But the reason we wanted to change our tooling was to give ourselves full flexibility over the architecture, as previously mentioned, but also the diversity of kinds of experiences we could, we could provide to customers and the many ways in which we can start bringing our products to life um, with that docs of code flexibility. So it was definitely user experience first. We also were interested in rolling out, I guess, what I call participative documentation. So we previously had four technical writers and a number of engineers under one team, and they were the people who did the docs. And if anyone else fed into that, it was just because there was a typo. So I'm a really big fan of, as Polina mentioned, tapping into the whole organization and particularly the nuance of like the implementation that developers are privy to or the, all the life hacks that support get to uh, learn in their day-to-day. -day. And it was really important that we find uh, tooling that facilitates that collaboration. And so moving to GitHub and uh, kind of Git-based collaboration with peer reviews and things like that so that we can still retain technical writing as a bastion of excellence and the, and the, um, the style guide what good looks like for the technical content was really important. So, uh, yeah, starting with user experience first, but also really important to benefit from these collaborative tools. I think to add to that, um, I, I just found it interesting the way you worded the question. Um, the way you worded it was, it sounded as if like there was potentially a way for us to work around that. But I think the whole point there is that we finally reached the critical mass where we would, could no longer find a way to work around that or the ways were still a compromise where we had to let some of our ideas go 
whereas we knew that there is an approach that we could try that could potentially allow us to no longer compromise on these things. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't even a matter of choosing between a workaround and an alternative. There was no longer a workaround, so we chose the alternative instead. If I look at it like a change process, you build up the momentum, um, you bring in everyone on board, uh, everyone's happy, you put in a lot of momentum, and then inevitably there's a there's this trough of disappointment in any change process, uh, and then then you get out of that and you reach a plateau. What was the disappointment that you had to drive the whole company and 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 community through? What was the hard part that came after the initial enthusiasm, and how did you drive out of that? I think the hardest thing was about how far down the garden path we had to get before uh, and lead the company to this end state before they would buy in, and we probably couldn't have done it without having diverse skills in our team. So we didn't bring in loads of other engineers and things to contribute to this. We really had to do the heavy lifting ourselves, had to really build the site, at least the first iteration of it, do a lot of the migration stuff and bring to life at least uh, more than an MVP, I would say, before people really saw where we were going and what the benefits were. It was quite difficult to, to get people to care. And I think part of that was you know, the role that documentation previously played in Kodak. Like people saw it as important, but I think misunderstood how important it is that to all the different personas we're selling to and internally, uh, that it is a key part of a sales process, that it's um, it's not just something a couple of devs at a customer will, will dip into once. Like uh, documentation is a really important representation of your business, if not the product. And so I think if we maybe people, if Kodak got that more beforehand, we'd had it, we would have had an easier time. But um, yeah, we basically had to do a lot of work ourselves. But, and then that buy-in sort of suddenly happened overnight, I'd say. And people suddenly uh, started contributing. And that really helped us pick up momentum and take us that last sort of 10% of the way. Uh, but we had gone, we had to do a lot of work ourselves. Luckily, I think it, people had been in pessimistic internally about how hard it would be to do Doxus code. And as I say, we were helped by having a lot of the skills ourselves. but. Um, we managed to do the brunt of the work in sort of two to three months while still maintaining the existing website. And that, if it had taken any longer, I think we would have lost trust. We were given that sort of time to crack on with the project because we, we said we didn't have any other choice, as Polina alluded to. But um, yeah, I think if you can really get your buy-in on your existing documentation and have a real recognition of the value that that plays in all kinds of processes in your business. Uh, that will really help navigate uh, times of flux, times of change like you're referring to. Is this also how you remember it, Paulina? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. The heavy lifting, especially in terms of building the actual site, um, a lot of that uh, Max was doing. So it was almost like up to a certain point, it was also happening behind the scenes, even for me. Um, and then suddenly one day he came to work and was like, hey, how about we do this instead now? And you're like, oh, that looks great. Let's give it a go. Why not? Um, so, yeah, I was obviously in in on the idea before the rest of the company was, but also not as early as Max had the idea himself. Um, so I think for me, the biggest the, the biggest hurdle that I saw was, yeah, literally getting people to to contribute, to learn the new the new process, to learn the new tools. Um, and I think it wasn't even necessarily the difficulty with uh, conveying the value of the new approach or anything like that, because it seemed that people uh, were quite receptive and understanding of what we were trying to achieve. And they also understood the value of correct documentation because you know even no matter what they thought about our own docs um you know the developers or anyone from the commercial team they are also users of documentation of other companies so they understand inherently the value of it but then when they're faced with the request of trying to do that themselves you know giving a hand contributing and stuff like that it's kind of getting over that block 
in, in their minds um, and sort of trying to present that not as, oh, one more thing I have to do myself instead of somebody else supporting it, uh, but kind of like presenting it more as a shared benefit and something where they can contribute and somewhere where they can see value much faster if they were to just rely on us or on me alone. Um, yeah, I think that was that was the biggest challenge um, that I saw. So you went from being the documentation creators into, um, what was the word you used? Stewardship of documentation. And um, you now talk to the, the, the mindset change in the contributors. Do you remember the mindset change in you? And I, I think I'm mostly asking you, Paulina, did you also have to go through a similar phase change in how you, how you identify with the docs? I think it was, for me, it was mostly getting over the fear more than anything, because uh, I'm generally quite receptive to changes of various sorts. And I also have heard about Docs Code and, you know, I know the reputation it has uh, in the technical writer community. So it was something that I was excited to see come into Kodat and moving from a CMS to that because it's a great experience to have for a technical writer also uh, and like getting all those skills under the belts, learning the process, um, you know, learning Git and all of those things. So I was excited by that. I was just, I guess, intimidated at first by the tools because, you know, that initial moment where you feel like you will never, you will never remember what the commands are. Um, and then also because I have uh, content uh, ownership privileges, I can go and change like the live docs in the main immediately. I don't, if, if I wanted to, I don't have to go through any sort of approval processes, uh, which obviously comes with a job. But also at the beginning, it's absolutely terrifying to be like, oh, am I following the right process so that I don't actually break anything that's currently live? Uh, but I think that was maybe a case of like, a week or a week and a half and I was creating PRs and approving things left and right after that uh there is there was no stopping me after that <laughs> I think also Polina went through a period of and and I did too as well of getting used to enabling other people like yeah. mm. building that culture of participation and and just technically removing the barriers from other people participating is quite upfront time intensive and if you're not used to being extroverted as a team that could be really difficult and you maybe don't even have touch points with these potential contributors so uh looking outward and and also feeling like old enough to go you should learn this because it's really important um took, took a bit of maybe we were slower to do that than would have been ideal in fact but uh i think believe we you've, you've got better and better at enabling other people right and you feel more and more comfortable I mean, I, so. I, I'd like to think that's what they will say. <laughs> I don't know. It's funny you say that uh, because um, one, one of the uh, technical writing is is a career that I switched to after doing something else previously. And one of the reasons why I say I went into it, I joke that because um, I can write docs on my own. I don't have to talk to other people. But funnily enough, uh, it's probably one of the most one of the roles in which you have to talk to the most people and very frequently and always like quite different audiences that you have to speak to as well. Um, and obviously, once you start doing Docs code and enabling others, that becomes even more so the case. Um, and to also add to what you said, Max, um, I think finding um, maybe not the right balance, but finding the right or well-balanced way to provide feedback to whoever is contributing I think I'm still working out how to do that or I'm still improving on what I do to be able to do that even better. Um, even like the meetup that I mentioned that we just hosted last week for Write the Docs, uh, we were talking about editing documentation. And even from that talk, I took away a few things that I'm like, oh, actually, this is how I could look to feedback to people when they come with a change that I review. Um, yeah, so... I, I hope I, you know, I think I got better at that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting challenge. Because you didn't switch, you now have two things that you need to balance. You still answer for the the perfect quality of the end result and uh, the enthusiasm of your contributors, uh, the continued enthusiasm of your contributors. And you have to answer for both. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And it also comes with um, the requirement to 
balance priorities, which I, I mean, I obviously still have some level of control over that, but when all of the requests go through you and you decide how you're going to line them out in your work is one thing, but when the content has already been produced by others, you still obviously prioritize, but it's sort of like, it's almost like a different approach because you no longer need to produce as much from scratch, but you do need to edit and review a lot more. And obviously people still come with different needs and you no longer have the excuse of saying, oh, I haven't written it yet. Cause they're like, no, we have written it for you. You just need to, you know, review, edit, uh, come back with feedback and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's a fun adventure. I think. Can you tell the one thing in particular, like one specific thing that was like counterintuitive that you have picked up, for example, on the, on the meetup on editing, psychological tricks it's not even I think it's not counterintuitive it's something that you just something that potentially doesn't cross your mind and you know when somebody says it to you and you're like oh well obviously that's how things should be done why why haven't we been doing this uh but um so the speaker that we had Michael Dodd he was um talking about how it's very helpful to provide prompts when you ask for feedback or when you give feedback. So instead of asking, like, what do you think about it? You can be more specific in your questions. Like the most recent thing that I've written up and asked Max to have a look at, I obviously am happy to just hear his thoughts on it. But my specific requests were, I can feel that there is an opportunity to simplify and shorten what I've written, but I can't see it yet. So can you have a look and tell me if you see that opportunity instead of just asking, you know, have a look and let me know. And you can do the same when asking for feedback, as well as when you give feedback to others, you can kind of like give those prompts for a person to think about. And again, when I say that out loud, it sounds obvious, but it wasn't something that was obvious or maybe it was something that I was doing like instinctively, uh, but wasn't conscious. And now it is, which is great. I think what that talks to is one of the biggest changes to the um, in moving to this kind of participative documentation model is as you move from a small group of regular collaborators where you actually, there's all these kind of implicit things about the way they work, the way they, they think and the way they ask for feedback, you understand and you don't have to ask explicitly for or they don't have to give you prompts on. And when you move to someone who's more regular in terms of when you collaborate with them, this engineer over here, you, you don't know whether they've paid any attention to spelling or copy. And it's like, should you spend time critiquing that and helping them do the formatting stuff? Or do you need to spend time focusing on like the more fundamental truth of the document? Do you need to help them with the layout and the, the structure of the content? Whereas if, you know, Polina and I work together a lot, she probably knows a lot of where she needs to focus her efforts more implicitly. Do you go back with a lot of feedback on yes sir, so if you do write something next time maybe or not or you just say i changed it a bit more like this so that it would be more according to our guidelines thank you for your contribution i think we try and explain as much as we expect of them so it can depend on the individual and it can depend on like how new to contributing they are so i think as a first-time contributor we definitely focus on making sure they've given us all the context we need to do our job and that they've got the detail in there, the factual stuff. If someone's been contributing somewhat regularly for a month or so, then we might make that more sophisticated feedback and we'd take over less of that writing process and we'd focus more on the bring it, making them more of a technical writer themselves, I guess. I think it also depends on at what point we got involved. Uh, because again, it, it depends on each individual contributor and how they prefer to work. Uh, but definitely some of them um, just get on with it and then come to us at a stage where they're ready for um, their draft to be looked at. But there are some who built the sort of relationship with us who prefer a bit more guidance at the beginning uh, or throughout the process. Um, and that very much changes the levels and the detail and the feedback that we need to provide and the timeline in which we provide it. One of the things we try to fight for is being brought into the process earlier. I think historically we'd often get looped in two weeks after the feature had been released, which is obviously not uh, ideal, then you're playing catch up the whole time. And obviously the earlier that you get technical writing's eyes on a feature that's upcoming, the better the content will be, the more collaborative that can be. And uh, we've definitely seen results get better as we've 
been thought of more earlier in a feature's life cycle. So at times scary, I think, to notice when you get involved by others earlier, you suddenly realize how much stuff is actually constantly happening in the company you used to not see before. And yeah, the volume of input that everybody would love to have in a perfect world, you know, if everybody had all the time in the world, the volume of input that people would welcome is incredible. Is your team part of onboarding now? Where do you meet your new colleagues? You had to do uh, the internal education of how to use the new uh, documentation um, processes, learn Markdown, I presume. If now somebody comes as a software engineer, is learning this part of onboarding or it will happen when when it will happen? Or it's, did, you, did you ask for it to become part formal part of onboarding or it comes when it comes? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot that we can still do with that. Uh, my experience or my impression is that it's it comes when it comes. Uh, people hear about it from their colleagues. Um, and I definitely have seen, just based on the questions that come up every once in a while, there is definitely value in doing uh, like regular or repeated sessions, uh, enablement sessions that we used to do initially there is definitely value in repeating them um occasionally um yeah i don't i i i probably would say we're not consciously part of onboarding uh but there's definitely value in being there i think when we switched over to our new doxis code approach we did run more uh, ceremonies more actual enablement sessions but we also built out um some self-consumable content in Confluence where people can see a combination of video guides and written documentation on how to contribute to both our docs and our open API specification. And I think we're lucky that we've reached a sort of critical mass to the point that when people have questions, we don't always need to be the people that answer them or help them out. Uh, so if someone asks, well, how can I contribute to the docs? How can I write a feature release? How can I edit this inaccuracy? Other people can usually help them out and because enough people at Kodak know how to do that. So you talked about how you changed the technical setup uh, and then uh, leading uh, your colleagues and yourselves through this change. Um, and I remember from um, the showcase presentation that Paulina gave and Max also talked about it afterwards, that this was not the only thing that changed, but that you also started focusing more on your enterprise offerings which means a different sort of um, measuring success of the documentation. And at the time, Max, you were saying that you are um, in the change process. You're looking what you should be measuring. What is the KPI for successful documentation when it comes to, to enterprise? Now, this is super, super interesting. Um, I don't think it's only Kodat who changed. I think the world is changing how we um, buy uh, B2B. And I would be very interested in uh, what you, as the ones responsible for the documentation, uh, see about this now. What is your KPIs, if you are allowed to say that? Or then, if not, uh, talk more to general terms. What would you look at? What would you analyze for, for metrics on the docs? Um, I have a slightly controversial opinion here, having sort of pursued this for a good while, which is that I think if you're looking for data and metrics, to tell you something with a top level stat and that is going to like really tell you you're winning on docs um you're you're probably naive and instead we've focused on over the past six months building a culture of improved user research and I, ideally proper ethnographic user study so seeing users in their element recreating their day-to-day -day and observing how they interact with our documentation i think there's something about the way that um, the tooling of websites, which is typically built for marketing sites uh, like Google Analytics and stuff, boils the, the viewer's experience down to a series of page views uh, and tries to measure engagement from that and bounce it and stuff like that. That is naive to the, the way in which docs are actually used and that it's a kind of a longer flow. Uh, there are telemetry tools like Amplitude where you can really begin to track a single user across um, multiple bits of the experience, but it's a, not a great fit for 
documentation unless you have logged in and you have like a proper way of identifying the user correlating them so um what we've instead turned our attention to over the past six months is really looking internally um and measuring internal net promoter score of our documentation and we have a lot of people internally who are in turn enabling uh, our clients whereas before that might have been a bit more self-serve and so maybe our solutions team our sales team our support team weren't so critical their opinion and their experience of the docs was less critical so our priority personas have changed as we are more reliant on our solutions team for instance to enable our clients particularly in bigger banks and other institutions like that and so we're really interested in their sentiment around our docs do they feel enabled on our docs do they feel like our docs enable them and so our current um i i track it actually as like an out of five but we're we're at like a 4.3 out of five and an internal sentiment on public docs and we're a bit weaker on overall developer experience so what our recent our last uh, monthly survey told us was actually where we're going to focus attention in the next six months is actually going to be more on internal developer documentation something we haven't really played so active a role in um and in combination with that kind of metric which obviously is a metric but i what i mean to differentiate that from like you know page views or or google analytics engagement stats and stuff like that um it's a kind of different kind of metric ideally we would have that from that kind of mps as well from customers but we've seen low engagement with that i think documentation is obviously a bit more transactional than the typical cadences at which you might gather mps so they're coming with a job and to disrupt them from that job actually might be detrimental to their consumption of the docs so actually really cautious about throwing in call to actions and things into documentation for that reason um but it's something i'm looking at to, in the future but actually uh, the the thing that's really enabled us to evolve documentation further has been as i say building out this user research study and i think this talks to a theme of going back to basics with in tech like i think in tech we're so emperor's new clothes and so like reinventing the wheel all the time but actually uh there are so many well established user research practices that we could be leveraging before trying to turn data and plugging telemetry tools into your docs and getting in a room with your user is something that's bizarrely rare in in tech in my experience um I, I, to be fully candid our, our design team for instance had not seen users use the product uh in the 12 months before I joined Coda and i think the same was true for documentation and there's so many nuances of user behavior and so much such breadth of interaction modes uh the skim reader versus the the word by word reader the someone who, who we have so many users who will never use the search functionality for instance and they're relying on side nav and there's so many users who will always use search and they're not interested in the careful architecting you've done and only by seeing them as users in the flash will you get those insights so that's been my big change in thought on this on this subject i'd probably also add to that that we do have google analytics and we do look at what it's saying uh but i think instead of potentially driving any choices or decisions it's more of a we look at it as more of a confirmation um or potentially um or just additional evidence to see what the result of the decisions we have already made um what the results of those are rather than using that as like guidance or measure of success is more of a just an additional interesting thing for us to look at and keep in mind rather than see it as gospel i guess can you tell me like a recent anecdotal specific example like you see not optimal feedback from one of your internal um solutions engineer on a specific documentation how does that roll through your team what do you do i i could talk to one thing we were trying and that has the user research immediately sort of put caution to that a uh, really cool tool called arcade arcade.software and it's a brilliant intersection of like step by step guide and video content and i was super excited by it and created a couple of arcades and i think through user research we've seen it's less intuitive just because it's like a nascent mode of interacting with docs like it's it's not a, something people are familiar with and maybe they skip over it or don't quite know how to interact with it uh that was really useful and i was 
going quite hard on it quite fast and trying to roll it out. And uh, I think the, the stats in the tool kind of told us that people were interacting and playing about with it, but actually only by seeing being in the room with people did we see they weren't doing it quite right or in the way we thought they were or the data was telling us they were. Polina, you know, I think you've had been running a lot of user research recently. Maybe there's some other things you can flag. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have an exact specific example, um, but it's more the impression of the most recent sessions that we've done. We've um, introduced a new webhook service to Kodad um, earlier in the year, uh, which also meant uh, a new set of documentation, obviously, to um, shed light on that. Um, and it was sort of like the perfect opportunity to do internal user research because the technology was also new for our company. Uh, so it wasn't just the users that had to learn and figure out how to do this. Our colleagues across engineering and commercials and sales, et cetera, they also um, needed to wrap their heads around it. Um, so we've built out some um, kind of user-based tasks um, that we asked some of our colleagues to resolve via documentation. Um, and I think the most fantastic thing was that I think we ran eight sessions overall. And with every session, I would come in and think, oh, there can't possibly, there couldn't possibly be another way that this person is going to interact with the dogs differently from the previous ones that we have already seen. Um, and then they would. It's like there is this endless combination of ways of thinking of ways of learning or ways of interacting um again which when you think about it i guess it makes sense in theory but when you actually see it happen it's incredible especially from people who although they're not familiar with this specific section of docs because it's new they are familiar with docs overall and they are familiar with kodak and still the difference in interaction that it drives is fascinating. There were a lot more actions that we took out of that than I ever expected it to. Uh, it was absolutely eye-opening. Because you are so close to user behavior, do you see that also changing? And here comes the AI question, okay? So <laughs> we couldn't leave this out. There's a lot of talking everywhere, especially in documentation circles, about how we have to prepare documentation for AI consumption. A little bit less about how people's behavior is changing. But do you see that changing, or at least the expectations? Or do you see warning signs of long-term changes already, or not yet? I see the change in user behavior from our contributor side. Well, in some cases, I know for a fact, and in some cases, uh, it just seems that some of our contributors choose to write the draft or run the draft through um, ChatGPT or even, you know, the example I gave at the showcase run through CoChat because obviously CoChat is a lot more familiar with our docs. So it kind of has the same, a, a similar kind of style idea or like the tone of voice because obviously it's uh, learned on our docs. Um, so I know some of our colleagues uh, use that or ChatGPT to sort of draft up the content before it comes to me or to Max or to anybody else in our team. Um, so I think that was an interesting change that we saw. Um, yeah, uh, but as Max previously mentioned, although we do have CoChat, we don't necessarily um, see that as our focus at the moment, which obviously might change later on. Uh, yeah. And in the, the wider documentation community, since you're a community organizer, do you hear these concerns about having to adjust behavior? Um, yes, uh, in the sense that, I mean, it's the hottest topic at the minute. It's like when X amount of years, everybody used to talk about Docs code. Now everybody talks about AI. Um, and maybe not as much in Europe, but I do hear... Um, more concerns, I guess, from North America or more um, examples of reliance on AI versus uh, like human brain or human writing. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've heard of a solution or a consensus, but I just can tell you that there is a lot of talk about that and there is a lot of interest. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting journey to try and uh, balance the use of AI with, um, you know, a, a human, a, a real life technical writer, if you will. Um, and I think I, I'm, I guess I'm of the opinion that AI exists to kind of 
make your life easier or make your job easier other than take it away from you. Um, so I guess it, it's going to be interesting to see how we all find that balance and how we find um, a way to incorporate that as a supporting tool rather than a replacement tool. Um, yeah, so I'm just excited to see where that goes. But I wouldn't say that it's currently something that um, Kodat is focused on as far as docs are concerned. Last closing question. What is the thing that you're learning right now as a technical writer? Oh, I feel like I'm constantly learning something. Yeah, I mean, two things, actually, I guess, uh, from, t- from two sides or like two sort of jobs or things that I do. Um, I'm currently looking more into um, information architecture. Uh, what I am is, as many of my uh, fellow technical writers are, I'm like a, a self-taught technical writer. Um, so I guess a, a lot of choices that I previously made were quite intuitive or experience driven. And now I'm trying to focus a bit more on like the theoretical background of information architecture, um, but perhaps not in a very academic way. Uh, but one of the books I'm currently reading is called How to Make Sense of Any Mess. And it's inherently about information architecture, but it can also apply to like other messes in your life, if you will. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking more and more detail into that. And then from a community organizer perspective, uh, because we're basically picking up right the Docs London from the ground up and trying to like keep it uh, or get the ball rolling again after a very long break. It was multiple years that nothing was happening in London and now it is again. It's kind of like, you know, social media content management and promotions and um getting um the information out there for people to learn about these events and come to these events on managing people's expectations when it comes to those events um and yeah just figuring out the best kind of digital marketing uh strategies um which was never something i had to do before because uh, you know if i don't know if if you have if you write docs for a company it's the marketing department's job that people find out about the company it's somebody else's job to make sure they like sign up with a company and docs end up very often like a, a natural um landing place whereas with the community we have to put the effort in ourselves to um publicize it and yeah so that that is a whole new skill set and a whole new experience that i am currently gaining it's an education i can attest to it Thank you very much. I'm really happy that we could uh, finally have this conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to all the amazing things that uh, Kodat is going to show us. Thank you. Thank you. And bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>